And uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce today's clock with speaker, Mireille Bouskimoulou. Uh, she's uh, at CNRS, Directrice de Recherche. That means she's in charge of the research. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really, yeah. uh, uh, So, um, at, uh, she's at the University of Bordeaux in uh, France. And uh, she uh, has uh, uh, long, uh, very prestigious background in combinatorics. She has won a lot of prizes uh, from the French Academy of Sciences, for instance. And when uh, uh, go back to mention when she was a young researcher, she also won the uh, very prestigious uh, competition among university students, uh, the uh, Agrégation de Mathématiques. It's called, right? It's a very long time ago, but uh, you were the first woman to win that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, and um, she has um, meant a lot to the algebraic combinatorial community in the world, uh, both by um, proving very strong results and finding interesting problems, and also uh, designing powerful techniques to prove things about. Uh, and some of them you will uh, hear about today, about the uh, asymptotics of uh, the number of combinatorial objects, for instance. Um, uh, she's also editor of five-year journals, published a huge number of papers, 75 or something like this, I think, and um, organizer of many workshops. Uh, so now I think the camera is ready, and I'm very happy that we have Marie Pusky Milou here as uh, our clock keeper. Please. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. I'm blushing. Uh, so thank you also for inviting me to this colloquium. I'm very pleased to be back in Stockholm. Can you hear me? No. no, no. Your microphone. You can't hear me? No. Well, you know what? You should sit here. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't hear I don't see why I should shout in a microphone when you should, re you should really shout. Closer. <laughs> hey, I see one. <laughs> <laughs> so this means that you want me to use this thing. Okay. It is on. Can you hear me better? Yes. yes. Okay. Now I have something in both hands. How should I manage that? Okay. Ah. Fine. So I'm going to talk about self body walks in two dimensions, and I start at the quiet pace by telling you what is a walk. So you take a two-dimensional lattice, and here you have the square lattice, which you should think of as an infinite grid. And you have a starting point here. And the walk is just any sequence of steps taken on the edges of this lattice. So north, south, east, west. And you see you allow going up and down and things like that. So I will systematically denote by N, your right front is a rose, <laughs> a problem by M, so you don't pay attention to the little row, just to the laser pointer. So N is the number of steps of the walk that is the length. Now my walk is said to be self-avoiding if it doesn't visit the same vertex twice. So this one to the right is self-avoiding. <coughs> and I'll be interested in one main quantity, namely the end-to-end -end distance between the starting point and the end point, which for a special reason, I did not by delta in the case of a general walk and by d in the case of a self body walk. That's no problem. So, by the way, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask them. I'd be happy to answer. So, there are a number of very simple questions that we can ask about these uh, very simple objects. And here are a few examples, starting with general walks. So, the first basic question is how many end step walks do you have? And well, at each time you can choose one of the four possible directions and so clearly you have four to the end of them. Uh, the next question deals with their asymptotic behavior and in particular with the average end to end distance. And if you think of this walk as a random walk, uh, that is as a sum of independent and centered random variables, 
then the central limit theorem tells you that the end-to-end -end distance grows like square root n on average. Okay, up to some constant gamma, kappa, sorry, that I denote between brackets, just to mention that from now on I will not write down the uh, multiplicative constants in my estimates. And in addition to this uh, behavior, we have in fact a probabilistic description of the limiting curve that you see when the size goes to infinity and you normalize your picture by square root n. What you see is the two-dimensional Brownian motion. Okay, so this is well known. And now we're going to ask the same questions for our self-avoiding walks. And suddenly they become much harder. And to say things uh, very shortly, well, we don't know what the answers are. We don't know what the number Cn of n step souls, so I often say soul, so for self-avoiding walk, we don't know what this number is, we don't know how the end-to-end -end distance scales, and we don't know, here it's not very clear, but you have a random self-avoiding walk, large size, and we don't know if the limit process exists, and we don't know what it is. So what I'm going to do now is that I will review one after the other these uh, three questions, and tell you that even though we don't know the answers, we have conjectures about these three questions. And I also tell you what is known, so that you can see the gap between the predictions and the theorems. So let me start with the uh, number of walks, Cn. Well, there's a conjecture about its asymptotic behavior. So these numbers should grow like first exponentially, like um, some mu to the n, where mu will depend on the underlying lattice. And then there's a correction by a power of n, n to the gamma. And the gamma itself, even though it is just a correction, uh, should only depend on the dimension. And moreover, in two dimensions, it's conjectured to be this nice rational number. 11 over 32. So if, if you're not familiar with this kind of, uh, of problems, you may think that it's a bit strange that the correcting term seems to be dimension independent, whereas the mu, um, well, lattice independent, sorry, whereas the mu, ah, I not use that. So, whereas the mu depends on the lattice. And so I want to give you another description of this gamma again in probabilistic terms. So assume that this asymptotic behavior is correct and consider the following problem. You take two walks of length n that start at the same point and you look at the probability that concatenated together they form a self-avoiding walk of length 2n. Then this probability is here given by its ratio and if this holds this non-intersection probability decays like n to the minus gamma. So really this gamma measures something, and if there is something like a limit self-avoiding walk, then it may be independent from the lattice. So anyway, that's the conjecture. Now what is known? Well, here's what's known. So first, we know that there, is, that there is a mu. In the following sense, uh, the sequence Cn to the 1 over n converges to something that we call mu, namely the growth constant. And now in terms of correcting terms here, we just have these bounds. So Cn for any n is larger than or equal to mu to the n. That's a lower bound. And we'd like to have an upper bound of the form mu to the n times n to some power, but we are very far from that. We only have an upper bound with a correction term in alpha to the square root n. And so not only these results are very far from the conjecture, they're also very old. 
they are more than 50 years old now, and they are the best that we have. And it's not because people have not looked at these questions, I promise. So, in the first part of my talk, I will show you some basic tools on sample running walks that prove these bounds. Now, let me turn to the second question. It is very, very pale. Okay. The end to end distance. So, it is believed strongly that it scales like end to the three quarters. So larger than for a random walk, where you would have the square root, be, square root and behavior, but of course less than a walk going straight, where you would have a linear end-to-end -end distance. So again, that's a nice conjecture with a nice rational exponent, but we have no proof of that, and what is known is this time very recent, but also rather disappointing. So let me start with the upper bound. <coughs> Duminil, Coppa and uh, Hammond proved <coughs> just a few years ago that the end-to-end -end distance is sublinear. So the walk doesn't go like this at a positive speed. So that's quite expected, but it was not an easy proof. And then on the lower bound, that's in a sense even worse. So Neil Madras proved this lower bound in n to a quarter. So that's very surprising. You would expect that at least this lower bound by square root n sounds quite intuitive because adding this self-avoidance condition somehow creates a repulsion in the walk, so it should tend to make the endpoints um, further apart. So that's certainly true, but it's not proved. So that's the lower bound at the moment. Are there questions? No. Now regarding the third question, the limiting process. Well, one problem is that we don't know if there is a limiting process, but if there is one, and if in addition it has certain properties of conforming volumes, then we know what it is. And in this case, it will be one of these uh, SLE processes, or schramm lochner evolution processes, uh, for a certain value of the parameter. And if this is true, you can somehow, I think, non-rigorously uh, re-derive the, these two exponents for the number of walks and for the end-to-end -end distance. So everything is in good at equation. Everything, everyone believes in those conjectures. Just a matter of proving. Okay, so this sort of concludes the uh, introductory part of my talk, but before I move to some details on the results, I just want to mention that in high dimensions, uh, life becomes easier, which is often the case in such Lewis models. So here the rough intuition is that when you have many dimensions where to go, the self-avoidance constraint becomes less strong, in a sense, and that self-avoiding walks will start resembling just general walks. And here are two or three uh, manifestations of that. So in dimensions five and more, um, sorry, so the number grows again purely exponentially, like the 4 to the n you had for random walks. The end-to-end -end distance becomes square root n, and the whole process converges to the d-dimensional Brownian motion. So we have recovered some properties of random walks. And these results are already 20 years ago. 20 years old. Okay, so Here's now somehow the outline of my talk. So we've only already been through the uh, introductory part. You've seen these uh, predictions and results. And now I will have two sections of uh, results by others. So the first ones are these bounds on the number of n-step self-body walks. 
by Herman Schulin Welsh, all things. And then I'll make a big jump in time uh, to show you a very, very nice recent result by Dominic Kopat Smirnov, who proved a conjecture of Nienhuis dating back from 82, according to which the mu, which describes the exponential growth of the number of cell body walks, is known and nice. It's not a scientific break number, not for the square lattice, but for the honeycomb lattice, that is the hexagonal lattice. So when this paper came out, that was an archive, some four years ago almost now, uh, it was quite a, a shock, in, at least in the combinatorics community, because many people had looked at this very charming conjecture, and uh, the proof was both very simple, it's maybe 10 pages in total, and very original. So, uh, and so of course many people started to wonder what, there's a new tool in the proof. So the question is, could we do something else with this new tool? And here's some well, partial answer to that with some colleagues, we've been able to prove another conjecture about walks on the Honeycomb lattice, involving also a nice algebraic number, and which deals, I'll tell you the details later, but it deals with uh, walks in a hard space. And then I will certainly not have time for the fifth part, uh, but I still want to mention that as it is natural and understandable, um, many people have tried to adapt this Dominic Copat Smirnov technique to the square lattice. Why, why does it so strongly depend on the Honeycomb lattice and does it so strongly depend on the Honeycomb lattice? And so there has been some partial results on the square lattice, but for slightly different walks at the moment. Okay, so at the moment I'm getting back to these old days to present these two uh, basic techniques on cell rewarding walks, concatenation and unfold. So here is again what we want to prove, the existence of this mu, cn to the 1 over n converges to mu, and the two bounds. So I guess that you somehow already suspect how the, uh, the existence of mu can be proved. Well, it's as often a sub-multiplicativity argument. So it goes as follows. If you consider a walk of length m plus n, then certainly it can be seen in a unique way as a concatenation of a walk of length m and a walk of length n which gives you this inequality, which is only an inequality because if you take any walks of length m and n, concatenate them, maybe you get something that has self avoidances. So now you have this very standard lemma that tells you that for a sub-multiplicative sequence, uh, the limit of Cn to the 1 over n exists, and in addition is the <coughs> infimum of these values. And with that, you already have the lower bound on C. So lower bound, that's just sub-multiplicativity. Now for the upper bound, what we need to do in a sense is to have an inequality in the other direction. That is, we need to be able to produce walks that you can concatenate and remain self-avoiding after concatenation. <laughs> and this is how the so-called bridges were designed, I think. So a bridge is a self-avoiding walk that satisfies two properties. So first, the origin is strictly to the left of any other vertex, and the endpoint is, say, weakly to the right of any other point of the lattice. And this means now that if you take two bridges and concatenate them, well, you 
just create a new, new bridge. So these ones are concatenable. concatenable. And so it gives you Bn is the number of n step bridges. Then the product Bnbn is this time smaller than the total number of bridges with n plus n steps. So you have this inequality in the other direction. Okay, for another type of walks, but we'll see how to uh, repair that later. And so this tells you that the sequence Bn to the 1 over n converges to some constant mu tilde, which is the supremum of these values. That's the same lever as before, but in the other direction. So now we have on bridges, we have an upper bound. So certainly this mu tweedle, which counts some self-rewarding walks, is at most equal to mu. So we have an upper bound on bridges and a lower bound on general self-rewarding walks. So somehow what is missing now is a way to find an upper bound on self-rewarding walks in terms of bridges. And that's what the other operation called unfolding is doing for you. So that's also something nice and geometric. So that's what we want to do. So I will first describe how you unfold uh, not a general self avoiding walk, just a half space walk into a bridge. So by a half space walk, I mean a walk like this one, where the origin is to the left of all other vertices, and for the end part you don't care. So if you take such a walk and you look at the abscissas it visits, so there's a largest abscissa it reaches, and you look more precisely at the last visit at maximal abscissa, so at this point. And then what you do is that you flip the rest of the path, or you reflect it in this vertical line, like here. Okay? So you get a new walk which maybe is not yet a bridge. So again, it has a last visit at maximal abscissa here, and you flip it again, and this time you get a bridge. So by successive reflections in vertical lines. Okay, so of course you get the same bridge from several different half-space walks, and so you have to give some additional information to recover the walk you started from, and I think it's quite clear that if you remember the positions where the reflections took place, then you can go back. And so this means remembering this sequence of numbers, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, which in fact form a decreasing sequence. So it's an integer partition in combinatorial terms. And in addition, the weight that is the sum of these distances, it's just the width of your final bridge, and in particular it's less than the total length of the walk you started from. Okay, so let me denote by Pn the number of such partitions. Then I claim that we are done, at least for half space walks, because their number is bounded by, well, the number of bridges times the number of such Partitions, bridges, we've already seen they are super multiplicative and then they are bounded by mu to the n. And then this number of partitions is known to be bounded by some beta to the square root n. So at this stage we have an upper bound on half space walks and then it remains to realize that the general self avoiding walk is just a pair of half space walks, and then you can bound Cn in terms of half, half space walks, and using the bound we have obtained for Hi, you get the upper bound for Cn. Just using concatenation and these reflections called unfolding. Okay, so that was the, so these tools you see all the time when people work with self modeling. Now I'll make this big jump in time 
to describe the what I call the DCS result because two minute copernicus is a bit long to say. So now we consider mm -hmm. we are still in two dimensions but with a different lattice. The hexagonal lattice, all vertices at the grid three, this will be important. And there's also another not so important difference, namely that it's convenient to uh, consider that walks start and end at mid edges of the lattice. It doesn't change anything, but that's convenient. So here's the DCS result. So again, you have this concatenation <coughs> argument that proves the existence of some mu, describing the exponential growth of the number of self-boarding walks. And so mu, as conjectured by Wienreuss, is the square root of 2 plus square root 2. Very nice guy. Okay, so in the DCS proof, um, it's not the number CN that are handled directly, but they are handled via their generating function. So that's a tool that's being used on and on in combinatorics. Instead of playing with members and recurrences, we play with generating functions and functional equations. So here, you can think of this x as you wish, either as a formal variable or maybe as a small complex number. And the generating function of source is this series c of x, the nth coefficient of which is the number c. So of course it captures all the sequence we want to study. <coughs> So you can also see it as a sum over all walks omega of x to the length. Okay, so every possible sum of any walk contributes a monomial in this series. Now there's this usual uh, standard result. This series has a certain radius, which I call rho, and rho is, well, the reciprocal of this limit, so usually it's the limb sup, but here we've seen that this is a limit, so rho, the radius, is 1 over mu, and we want to determine mu for the Hanekan lattice. So this means that if I define x star to be the reciprocal of the conjectured value of mu, then what we really want to prove is that this generating function has radius x star. That's just a basic reformulation. So that's what the DCS did. <coughs> or more precisely, since several families of self-rewarding walks are known to have the same radius, namely arches and bridges, so I should Find them bridges we've already seen, but they were growing from left to right. Whereas now, a bridge is something that has that starts at minimal abscissa and ends at maximal abscissa here. And arches are those walks that start and end at minimal abscissa like that. So they form kind of well, kind of bridges. But then, since this is a bridge, this is a bit uh, counterintuitive. So it's been known again for more than 50 years that the series C, that counts all self-rewarding walks, has the same radius as the series of arches or bridges. So we would be just as happy if we could prove that one of these series has radius x star. Okay, so now here is the main tool in the DCS proof. It's something very nice and, at least in my community, very original and striking. So it's an identity, which I call the global identity, uh, which relates three generating functions for several one walks. One big difference is that now we just consider walks that live in a finite domain, this little trapezoid. So it's described by its height, h, <coughs> and its width or half width at the bottom, l. Now the walks we consider, they start from here, in the middle of the bottom line, and they must end 
on one of these boundary half edges here. So they come into three types. So you have the arches that end on the bottom boundary with the generating function A. You have again the bridges that cross the whole thing and end at the top. And you have the walks that exit on one side or the other. I don't have a special name for that, but I denote by E, like exit. They are generating function. Okay, so for any pair HL, we have these three generating functions. And so you realize that on a finite domain, a self avoiding walk cannot have an arbitrary large size because it visits every vertex at most one. So this means that these series are just in fact polynomials okay, that you can compute for small values of H and L by drawing the corresponding groups. And so the global identity of uh huh, interesting. It's not working anymore. Something? <laughs> Can't get to the issue. You'll never get to see the global identity. Uh, it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Your computer. It's your remote. <laughs> yeah, it's lost connection. Yeah, yeah. okay. So let me use my. Oh, but the pointer is not as good. Okay, I use mine. Okay, so I should forget yours. Oh, it's learning, so what is mine saying? Ha! Huh. Here's the global identity. <laughs> So this identity is telling you the following strange thing. If you, now my pointer is rather pale, sorry. So if you take these three polynomials and evaluate them at this specific value that we believe to be the radius of convergence of self avoiding walks, then a certain linear combination is one with some positive coefficients, alpha, here one for bridges, and some epsilon here. And this should hold for every H and L. So that, that's very strange to be able to say something like that, because we don't know these individual series. I mean, for small values we can compute them, but where does it come from? And I'll tell you later where it comes from. Meanwhile, I want to look at an example just to convince you that there may be some truth here. So I take a rather degenerate uh, domain, maybe it's D11, I don't know, and I form the generating function of arches, bridges, and walks that exit on the side. So for arches, I just have two of them. They have length three, hence this contribution. For bridges, there are four of them. Two have length two, and these two have length one, two, three, four, five. So they are the ones that end at the top of the domain. And for the series E, I have two walks of length four. So the linear combination that I form is this one, for these values of alpha and epsilon. And so it's a polynomial in X with positive coefficients. If I plot it, it looks like this and it reaches the value 1 precisely at this x star. <coughs> and this will happen for any trapezoid uh, of size HL. So are there questions on this, uh, on what I'm doing here? I think you said the bridges were of length 2 and 5, but they are 2 and 4. Right? It's 4. More questions? No. So here's again the identity. And before I tell you where it comes from, I want to show you how you can use it 
to prove that the radius is indeed x star. So I will actually only do the lower bound. It's a very simple argument. You have all the details on this page, so be brave. <laughs> so let's believe in the global identity. And now imagine that your trapezoid goes to infinity. Okay? So this series AHL, it's counting more and more arches because an arch that fits in some trapezoid fits in all larger trapezoids. So these numbers, they are numbers because the series is evaluated at x star, they grow as H and L grow. And in the limit, they count all arches, because given any arch, there's one trapezoid that contains it, provided it's large enough. So this numbers, this sequence of numbers, grows to the generating function of all arches evaluated at x star. Okay, that's easy. But then getting back to this identity, we see that all these values, since this is positive and this is positive, these values are bounded by 1 over alpha. So you have an increasing sequence that's bounded, so the limit value is finite. And this tells you that the generating function of arches converges at x star. So certainly the radius of convergence cannot be smaller than x star, otherwise it would diverge. So that's nice and simple. The other argument for the upper bound is just a bit more intricate, but really not much more. And when you put this together, well, you have a nice proof that the radius of, say, arches uh, is this conjectured value. And that's it. So, of course, the key ingredient is this identity. And since its proof is also nice, I want to tell you where it comes from. So it comes from what I call the local identity, which is something even more precise that is valid now at every vertex of the domain. So we consider again our trapezoid here with the starting point A, and we take P to be just any mid-edge, not necessarily a boundary edge, mid-edge. And for any P, we consider the generating function of walks going from A to P, and we count them according, it's not very clear probably, according to two parameters, so first the length, which is still encoded by this uh, variable x, and then we have another parameter, which is the winding number, namely the difference between the number of times where you turn left and turn right. So in a sense, this theta, or rather e to the i theta, is playing for the winding number the role that x is playing for the length. So here, for instance, you have a walk that has, I'm just reading, six uh, left turns and four right turns. So the total length is 10 and the winding number is 2. So for each possible mid-edge P, I have a generating function counting walks from A to P. And now what happens is this rather miraculous thing. Namely, if you take a vertex V of your honeycomb lattice, so here you have one cell of the honeycomb lattice, here one other. So you take a vertex and consider the three adjacent mid-edges, P, Q and R. Okay, so to each of them is associated one such generating function. Now if you evaluate these generating functions at x star, or the length variable, and at minus 5, pi over 24 for the theta variable. Then a very simple linear combination of these three now numbers vanishes and the coefficients here like p minus v 
so P is above V, P minus V, you have to think of it as a complex number. So you really embed your honeycomb lattice in the complex plane, and so P minus V would be I, and R minus V would be E to the minus I pi over 6, or something like that. So once you have a fixed x and theta, this series have become numbers, complex numbers, and so you should think of P minus V and his friends also as complex numbers. Okay, so that's one of Smirnov's favorite tricks, a very elementary descriptions of his uh, pre-holomorphic discrete functions or whatever. And the proof of that is simple. So what can this mean? So if you look at the left-hand side here, we are just counting walks from A to some mid-edge in the vicinity of V, according to some weight, x to the length, this thing with the winding number, and in addition, a weight that tells you at which point here you at. And we want to prove that this sum is zero. And so what we are going to do is that we're going to group all these works, all these walks, in little groups of two or three walks, and prove that the contribution of every group is zero. And the way of grouping them is very simple. So you just put together walks that only differ by their behavior around the vertex P. So these two walks go together in a group, and these three walks go together in a group, and up to symmetries, that's the only kind of groups that you see. And then I claim that in each group, the contribution vanishes. And this is not hard to check because, okay, so maybe you don't know what is the global contribution of this walk, but what you can measure is how it's modified when you replace this left turn by a right turn. And similarly here, and so you just have to check these two identities relating theta and x, and they hold for the two values of theta and x that I've given. So there's a bit of a, a miracle in that, but in a sense there had to be a miracle somewhere. And so this gives you the local identity. And now, uh, to get back to the global one, well, you just take the local thing and you will sum it over all vertices of the grid. Okay, so now if you consider some f of p, where p is a mid-edge that is not at the boundary, so say this one here. So I claim it occurs twice, one for the vertex above, <coughs> one for the vertex below. But in one case, it will have a factor of p minus v, in the other case, a factor of p minus v prime, and so v is above, and prime is below, so these two factors are opposite numbers. And so this means that the inner mid edges p do not contribute when you sum this. And so you're left with generating functions of walks ending on the boundary, like my arches, bridges, and e walks. <coughs> For those, you know what the winding number is. It's always the same. For instance, bridges have a winding number zero. And then you use the right-left symmetry of the domain, and what you get is this identity. So I would say that you've seen here most of the proof of the square root 2 plus square root 2 result. Okay, so as I said, when this came out, uh, a number of people uh, asked, oh, what else are we going to do with that? And that's quite natural. And so, Here's one partial answer, so that's a result obtained with the, so Hugo Gimilic Copin, who was already involved in the first result, and the three colleagues from Melbourne, Nick Beaton, Ian De Geer, and Tony Goodman. And so we've proved 
another conjecture, not as old and probably not as nice, but still with a nice number, for these walks on the Hanukkah lattice. So I will mostly tell you what the conjecture is. So there's two differences with the preceding question. First, we just want to handle walks that start at the origin and then stay in the upper half plane above this line. So that's why I have this bar in my notation, C and bar for the number of such walks. And in addition to that, we have a parameter y, which is often called a fugacity, which weights what I call the number of contacts of the walk, that's the number of visits on this line. So for instance, this walk has one, two, three contacts, and hence a contribution y cubed in one of these polynomials. Okay? So now instead of numbers counting walks, I have polynomials in one variable y. And then I can make the same story as before. I put them in some generating function using an additional variable x. And now I fix y as a positive parameter on my fugacity. And so this series in x has a certain radius of convergence, um, this row of y, which has a reciprocal mu of y, which is, so mu is the limit of cn to the 1 over n, as before. So here there's one reference, which means that there's one theorem somewhere, and the theorem is that this is actually a limit. So if you remember, the previous result for all walks was easy to obtain by concatenation. But here, it's harder to concatenate half-space walks, especially if they are weighted by the number of contacts, because you have one that starts at this level, it ends there, and then you start a new one, but the contacts of the new one are not on the boundary line, so it's definitely a more difficult result, but it's been proved anyhow. So, in addition to this uh, result, a number of properties of this <coughs> radius are known, and here they are. So that's again the definition, rho of y. And this is, it is known to be a continuous function of y, so y is positive, and the continuity is not hard to prove. It just comes from the fact that the number of contacts is at most linear in the length. That's very easy. Uh, it's even easier to prove that this is a weakly decreasing function just because as y increases, your polynomials cn of y, they become larger. So the radius must become smaller. Now at when y is 1 here, we are not weighting contacts, we are just counting walks in half space. And, for instance, bridges. But I've told you that bridges have already the same growth constant as all self body walks. So this means that at 1, the radius is 1 over mu for the mu that we've computed before. And it's easy to see that this holds as well between 0 and 1. So you have this continuous weakly decreasing function that's constant between 0 and 1, and the question is, is it always constant, or does it start being less than 1 over mu at some point? And there is such a point, and this is what is called the critical fugacity. So the point at which the radius of convergence, or it's reciprocal, the growth constant, stops being a constant. So this is some analytic description, which you may or may not like. Here's a probabilistic description. So you now fix a large size for your walks, 
and you pick one of them uniformly at random, and its probability is proportional to y to the number of contacts. That is, if y is very big, with a high probability, you will pick a walk with many contacts, something like that, something that sticks to the surface or to the boundary of the half plane. And if y is small, then the walk will tend to escape. And it can be proved using the previous definition of YC, the analytic one, that uh, a phase transition occurs at YC. Namely, if Y is larger than YC, then you have a positive fraction of the vertices that lie on the surface. So the walk is absorbed, as some physicists would say, whereas before YC, it is dissolved. That is a zero proportion of vertices in the limit where n goes to infinity lies on the surface. And so what we've proved and was conjectured by Bachelor and Young is that this phase transition occurs at this value. So, as you can guess, one ingredient in the proof is an extension to these weighted walks of the DCS global identity, and indeed that's our first ingredient. Um, actually, that's the zeroth ingredient for an embarrassing reason that I'm going to tell you. So we did what well what we would all dream of doing, that is we put weights Y for the contacts with the bottom line. And we tried to work out, using the same technique that I presented to you, some global identity that relates generating functions of arches, bridges, and e-walks. We were able to do so. The only difference, so here the coefficient is still 1, here it's still this epsilon. And the only difference is that arches you need to distinguish whether they reach their end point from the right or from the left, something like that. And you have two different coefficients here. OK, so that's one identity. Uh, so we want to prove that yc, the critical efficacy, is 1 plus square root 2. It's not very clear that something happens here at 1 plus square root 2, and in fact, we've not been able to exploit this to prove this uh, conjecture. So what we did instead, and seems certainly less natural, is that we put weights on the, the upper boundary. So this is a bit shocking because in the original problem they are on the same side as the starting point. Now they are on the other side. So maybe this is not so shocking because if you walk a bridge, a longer bridge in the wrong direction, well, somehow you have restored the fact that the starting point and the contacts are on the same sign. Okay? But what was encouraging was the form of this identity. So it reads as before, but now the only coefficient that has changed is the coefficient for bridges and something happens when y reaches y star, this vanishes. So this was an encouraging sign. So in passing, I want to underline that this is really stronger than the original identity, which was an identity between numbers, because now, here, you have this fugacity y, so it's really an identity between polynomials. So that's the first ingredient. Um, we need a second and a third. <laughs> so the second ingredient is here, in a sense, to repair the damage we've done by putting these contacts on the top rather than on the bottom. And the second ingredient is just a different characterization of YC of the critical efficacy. So the YC is still the one for the original problem with contacts here. 
but we would like now to describe it in terms in terms of something that tells you about upper context rather than lower context. So here is <coughs> sorry, here is how it looks. So you consider a domain that's no, no longer finite but interpolates between the trapezoid and the half plane. It's a strip, infinite strip of height h. Like and you consider arches in this strip weighted <coughs> in the wrong way, that is with the upper complex. And you form a generating function that keeps track of the length and of the number of these upper contacts. And it can be proved that, well, first, this series can be evaluated at x star, that is, it will converge, then it becomes a series in y, and as a series in y, it has a certain radius of convergence, y h, that decreases to y c. Okay, so you may want to forget about the details, but what this is doing is that it describes the quantity we want to determine, this yc, in terms of a problem with upper contacts. So here's maybe another possible description. Here I have the xy plane, and for each counting problem that I consider, I have a boundary curve, so here in purple, you have the curve. For values below the curve, the series of arches counted by length and bottom contacts, so that's our original problem, converges. And up above this curve, it diverges. And here, for any height h, you have a strip of height h, and you have again a limit curve under which generating function for arches in the H strip converges and beyond the curve it diverges. And what happens is that the sequence of curves that you get for larger and larger widths or heights accumulates on the purple curve. And in particular, if you consider the value x star, here you have this radius yh that I defined before, and these values yh, they will accumulate to yc. Okay, so with this alternative characterization of yc, you can get the lower bound on the critical fugacity, and that's as simple as the part of the DCS proved uh, for the lower bound for, for rho. So we take the global identity and we even set, uh, we specialize y to y star so that bridges disappear. There we are. And then we have a similar argument as before. So here it is. Now you fix the height. But you still let the width of your trapezoid go to infinity. So this thing here is counting more and more arches. In the limit, it's counting all arches in a strip. But the limit is finite because of the global identity. And so what we have obtained is that the series of arches in the H strip evaluated that X star Y star converges but it has radius yh, so yh must be at least equal to y star. And thanks to our second ingredient, which says that this yh converge to yc, this gives you the lower bound. So it's, I mean, you don't have to follow the details, but it's the same kind of theory as before. The upper bound is now significantly more complicated, and we were stuck for a long time by it until Hugo Lubinil Copin came to our rescue, having written uh, this paper with Hammond that proves that the end-to-end -end distance is sublinear, he was able to recycle the proof of this paper to prove something 
on the generating function of bridges that we badly needed, and which is our third ingredient. I won't tell you more about that. And from that, we were able to conclude that the critical fugacity is what it is believed to be. Uh, before I conclude, I just want to mention that since this honeycomb lattice uh, is not invariant by a rotation, you have a na another natural uh, half space problem where you would confine your walks to the right half space with contacts like here. And one of my co authors, Nick Beaton, uh, recycled our proof with some additional difficulties to prove that then the critical fugacity is this other algebraic number. Okay, and I want to finish with uh, two questions that I find attractive. I'd like to prove any of them. <laughs> um, so there's another problem of interacting several walks. Now you take them in the full space. They are not confined anymore to the upper half plane but they still interact with the horizontal axis. That is, you put a weight, y, each time you visit, you cross the horizontal axis. And then it is believed that there's also a critical fugacity, but this time it should be one. That is, as soon as you encourage a bit contact, then the walk sticks to, um, to the axis. And this seems to be the case also for the square lattice and so on, but since we have one more tool here on the honeycomb lattice, I wonder if it could be used to prove that. And the second problem that I want to mention is that these uh, self-holding walks are just a special case of the so-called O of N loop model, for which you have a similar global identity and a similar conjecture by Linhois. And the question is, could one prove this Ninhois conjecture, which gives some growth constant for some configurations, uh, away from the n equals zero value? Okay, now I'll stop with just a few references. Thank you. We have some questions. So what's the difference for the square lattice? <laughs> <laughs> what's the plan, I promise? Well, the square lattice has degree 4. So if I want to make it short, oh well, first there's something like a conjecture, but not a very strong one. <laughs> Who's laughing? <laughs> so the status of this conjecture is very, very different for the square lattice than what it was for the honeycomb lattice because this is just numerical but it's still striking because so people are counting or are getting estimates for this growth constant with more and more precision and so at some point they decided to look for a bi-quadratic number that would fit with these first maybe eight decimals they found this one and then a few years later, they got maybe three more digits, and oh, it was still in that equation with that. And a few more years, they got two more digits, and it's still, it seems still to be the correct value. I have no, so that the true theoretical physicists would scream at that, and they do scream, but still. <laughs> so anyway, what doesn't work is that you can try to prove a local identity. Now you have four vertices. So here, I have seen the length, I have added one parameter that counts how many times you go straight ahead at the vertex, there's still a winding number. And I would say the main difficulty is that you have too many possible configurations around uh, a vertex. So you have too many equations uh, relating this uh, theta, t and x. And what has been done by, uh, well actually now there's a paper by Glassman that goes beyond that, Glassman is a student of Smirnov, is to consider self-avoiding walks that can 
visit the same vertex twice, but just in this way. And then if you weight them by some special and not so intuitive numbers, in particular you're not counting them, you're putting a weight for these contacts and on other weight for, I don't know what, uh, these things, then you get a, a growth constant. But it's for a family of walks that are not exactly the same body walks and that are weighted in a bizarre way. Okay, more questions? Okay. You had a lot of constants involving square roots of 2. Yeah. Now, how do the minimal algebraic equations look that have them as uh, solutions? Is there anything special with these polynomials? Well, it's related to the cosine of pi over 8 and things like that. How does that come in in a honeycomb lattice, pi over 8? Uh, it's, the pi over 8 is just coming from this very special value of alpha. Oh, I'm going in the wrong direction. Oh. That's, that's strange. I'm going backwards. You will soon recognize what you've seen. So the pi over 8 and things like that is just coming from solving this equation here in theta, which means there's a few possible choices, but that are. But that your theta has to be that. But there's, I mean, there's nothing geometric really in that, as far as I can see. Any other questions? Well, then let's thank Ray again.